Welcome to the IRS and you. In this video, we will be discussing some common issues that many taxpayers face when dealing with the IRS. Specifically, we will cover some basics of IRS practice, like taxpayer rights and the assessment of tax and penalties. Then we will get into what a taxpayer can expect when dealing with an IRS tax collection issue or even an audit. And finally, we will discuss some ways of resolving a tax debt and the best practices going forward to try to avoid IRS inquiries altogether. So let's start out with some basic principles relating to the IRS and federal income tax. Many people think of the IRS as just another government agency focused on taking more and more of their hard-earned money. And to some extent, that may be right. But no matter how you slice it, there's a lot of fear and mistrust of the IRS by the common taxpayer. Many of my clients feel powerless or that the system may be stacked against them. However, one power that the taxpayer does have is enumerated in, in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. This is essentially a list of basic rights afforded to all taxpayers to help ensure that they are treated fairly. For example, each taxpayer has the right to be informed, the right to quality service, the right to pay the correct amount of tax, the right to challenge the IRS if the taxpayer feels that there's an error, and the right to appeal an unfair ruling. Taxpayers also have the right to have their tax matters concluded in a timely manner, and the right to keep their sensitive information private and confidential. Taxpayers are free to engage another person to represent them, and they have the right to a tax system that is fair and just. There are many ways a tax can be accessed. The first one is fairly obvious. When a taxpayer files a return showing a tax balance due, but doesn't pay that tax when due, that amount will be assessed against them. It, likewise, if a taxpayer simply does not file a return, but is required to, the IRS will eventually file a substitute return on their behalf. This is rarely in the taxpayer's best interest, as the IRS only uses information reported by third parties, like W-2 or 1099 earnings. This usually results in a larger assessment than if a taxpayer filed his or her own return because the substitute return contains all of the income, but little or none of the applicable deductions. Even taxpayers who file returns and pay the tax due on time can still be assessed additional tax at a later date, either by an adjustment to their return based on the third party reporting or as a result of an audit of their return. Of course, when an assessment is made, penalties and interest start to accrue, making the assessed balance much greater. Trust fund recovery penalties only apply in business situations when a quote unquote responsible person of a company withholds the required taxes from an employee's wages but does not turn those taxes over to the IRS. Those persons can be found personally liable for that tax through the trust fund penalty. The most common statutes of limitations for the individual income taxpayer are the assessment and the collection statutes. When a taxpayer files a return, the IRS generally must assess any additional tax on that return within three years from the filing date, or else they lose their right to do so. However, as with any rule, there are exceptions. If the taxpayer is found to have filed a false or fraudulent return with the intent to evade tax, or has simply neglected to file a return at all, the IRS can assess without regard to the statute. Sometimes in an audit situation, the taxpayer will voluntarily agree to extend the statute to prevent a quick assessment by the examiner before the statute expires. Once an assessment's been made, the IRS generally only has 10 years to collect from a taxpayer. This 10-year time frame is put on hold while an offer and compromise or an installment agreement is being reviewed by the IRS, or in cases of a pending appeal, Likewise, if the taxpayer is attempting to discharge tax in a bankruptcy proceeding, or if a taxpayer lives outside of the U.S. for more than six consecutive months, the statute can be told or put on hold. One of the hidden dangers of not filing or not paying tax when due are the penalties and interest which accrue on a tax liability. Some of these penalties can also be assessed years after filing a return, as in the case of an audit adjustment. We will discuss the most common penalties that the average taxpayer may encounter. For example, the penalty for the failure to file a return when due is 5% of the unpaid tax per month 
for a maximum of five months or 25%. In the case of a failure to pay tax when due, the penalty is 0.5% of the unpaid tax amount per month, up to a maximum of 25%. If there's a small silver lining here, it is that when both of these penalties are assessed, the failure to file penalty is reduced by the failure to pay penalty. Of course, that means that the maximum penalty for both penalties together is only 47.5% instead of 50. Pretty small potatoes. The failure to deposit penalty applies to businesses which do not make their regular deposits on time. For this penalty, there's a sliding penalty scale ranging from 2% to 10% depending on when the deposit is actually made. And if a deposit is not made electronically as required, a 10% penalty can be assessed for that as well. So once a tax has been assessed and the taxpayer does not immediately pay the amount due, we move into the collection side of the IRS. The collections department makes up a significant portion of the IRS workforce. This is the department that mails out those unfriendly notices and may even send one of their officers to conduct a visit of your home or a business. Although the collection process can be stressful, the worst thing a taxpayer can do is to ignore correspondence from the IRS. Because the fact is, the IRS is not going to forget about the liability, and the problem will only get worse as time goes on. Typically, when a taxpayer does not pay what they owe, the IRS will begin sending increasingly threatening letters to the taxpayer. The first notice is simply a statement with a breakdown of how the balance due was calculated. If the taxpayer ignores this notice, he or she will receive a reminder notice of the balance due several weeks later. If the taxpayer again does not contact the IRS after the second notice, they will re then receive a notice of intent to levy, stating that their state tax refund can be levied and that liens can be issued. The final notice of intent to levy is the next notice that is mailed out if the taxpayer does not contact the IRS. This letter gives the taxpayer 30 days to appeal the determination and request a hearing before the IRS can levy their bank account or garnish their wages. Sometimes these collection matters are handled by ACS, or Automated Collection Service, in a centralized location around the country. Other times, a local revenue officer will be the one handling the tax matter. And recently, the IRS began handing over certain collection cases to private debt, debt collectors to resolve. So, in the event that a taxpayer's liability remains unpaid, the IRS does have the power to issue liens. First, a general unfiled lien, and later a notice of federal tax lien, which is recorded against the taxpayer's real property or filed with the Secretary of State. These liens also show up on credit reports. The IRS can also levy all the money in the taxpayer's bank account, although the bank must hold on to that money for at least 21 days to give the taxpayer a chance to respond. The IRS can garnish a taxpayer's wages by contacting his or her employer and can even get up to 15% of Social Security benefits. The most severe action the IRS can take is the seizure and sale of a taxpayer's property. However, this usually only happens when the taxpayer has been unresponsive for some time and all other attempts to resolve the tax matter have failed. Another semi-new rule is that the IRS can report a tax delinquent individual to the State Department and cause the rejection or revocation of the taxpayer's passport if he or she owes more than $52,000. In the event a lien is filed, the taxpayer still does have options. For example, the lien will be released altogether in the event that the tax is paid in full or if the IRS fails to collect the amount due within the collection statute time period. Similarly, the lien will be released if all amounts are paid under an accepted offer and compromise. Sometimes the IRS will agree to withdraw a lien if it will help the taxpayer pay the tax more quickly. Although the lien is still valid, the record of the lien would be withdrawn. When a property is attached by a lien and is being sold, the taxpayer can apply to the IRS for a lien discharge which removes certain property from the lien notice. This allows escrow to close on the property without the lien getting in the way. The IRS will usually want to be paid from the sales proceeds or otherwise ensure that the taxpayer still has sufficient assets to secure repayment of the amount due. In a refinance situation, 
Sometimes the IRS will agree to a lien subordination where other creditors have priority over the IRS with respect to repayment of the debt owed. Now it's time to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the tax audit. Many taxpayers fear this examination process and assume the worst when selected for audit. But the fact is, the chance of a taxpayer's return being selected for audit in a given year is relatively low. Only about 0.5% of filed returns are audited, according to IRS statistics available from 2017. Around 75% of these, these audits are done via a letter requesting additional documentation or substantiation of a certain item or issue reported on their return. These are called correspondence audits, and they are generally used for simple issues or discrepancies. The remaining 25% of audits are conducted by IRS examiners in person. These audits are more comprehensive and generally consist of a complete review of the tax return. There are a few different ways that returns are selected for audit. If there are discrepancies between the filed return and information reported to the IRS, like W-2 or 1099 income, that may trigger a red flag in the IRS system. Income tax returns are given a computer score based on the information provided. The higher the score of the return, the more likely it is that the return will be selected for audit. Sometimes, if the IRS is looking to examine a certain issue that is common to many returns that year, they will select a sampling of such returns in an effort to understand how to better handle those certain issues. The actual examination process depends on the type of audit that is being conducted. In a correspondence audit, for example, the IRS will generally ask for more specific documentation related to a certain issue or item on the return. Sometimes the IRS may include information as to the amount and reason they believe the taxpayer owes additional tax penalties or interest. The taxpayer is given an opportunity to prove that the return is correct as filed. Most taxpayers choose to handle these types of audits via mail, although they do have the right to request a personal interview with a local examiner. Field audits, on the other hand, always involve a personal meeting with the examiner. The taxpayer or the taxpayer's representative can schedule a reasonable time and place for the interview with the examiner. The taxpayer will know ahead of time what information and documentation the examiner has requested so that he or she has sufficient time to gather these items. The auditor also asks questions of the taxpayer relative to the issues being investigated. Once all the information and documentation has been reviewed, the auditor will issue his or her report stating what changes, if any, will be made to the return. Once that audit report has been issued, the taxpayer has several options if he or she does not agree. The first step is discussing the auditor's findings with the auditor, and if necessary, with the auditor's manager. If the report main, remains unchanged, the taxpayer will receive a letter stating that the taxpayer has 30 days to appeal the proposed changes. The taxpayer can then file a formal appeal with the IRS Office of Appeals. If the taxpayer does not file the appeal in time or cannot resolve the issues with the appeals department, the taxpayer will then receive a letter known as the Notice of Deficiency from the IRS. The taxpayer must file a tax court petition within 90 days or 150 days if addressed to a taxpayer living outside of the U.S. of the date on the notice. Once filed, the taxpayer will have another opportunity to resolve the issues with another appeals officer and the tax counsel representing the IRS before trial. Finally, if the two sides still cannot come to a resolution, then the matter will be heard by the U.S. Tax Court. Now, for those taxpayers who have been assessed with additional tax, penalties, and interest, and do not dispute the validity of the assessment, their efforts will be concentrated solely on resolving the liability in question and preventing collection action from taking place. There are several ways to go about resolving a tax liability. The most obvious way is to pay the amount due in full, although the majority of taxpayers have to find another way. Bankruptcy is an option for discharging tax debt. However, each separate assessment must meet strict criteria based on how much time has elapsed since the due date of the return, the filing of the return, and the assessment of the amount due. Even if a tax liability can be discharged from bankruptcy, 
it will have a significant negative effect on the taxpayer's credit history for many years to come. In cases of extreme hardship, where the taxpayer cannot afford to pay anything for the time being, the IRS may agree to put the taxpayer into currently not collectible status. This essentially puts the collection action on hold until the next periodic review one to two years later. The most common resolution options are the installment agreement and the offer and compromise, which will be discussed more in depth in the following slides. An installment agreement is a way for the taxpayer to pay off what he or she owes on a monthly basis over time. Once an installment agreement is in place, and assuming the taxpayer is making the correct payments as agreed, the IRS will cease all further collection action, although sometimes liens do remain filed. If the liability is under $50,000, the IRS does not require a full financial analysis to set up the agreement provided the total liability will be paid within a certain period of time. For liabilities that exceed $50,000, the IRS will require a full financial review, including past bank statements, monthly invoices, asset and income information, etc., in order to determine how much the taxpayer can pay each month. The most frustrating thing for most taxpayers in this group is that the IRS only counts certain expenses as reasonable. This sometimes results in a situation where a taxpayer may not have any money left over to pay the IRS, but on paper, it shows that they can pay a significant amount each month because not all of the taxpayer's actual expenses are accepted for purposes of calculating the payment amount. Also, it's important to keep in mind that with installment agreements, penalties and interests continue to accrue during the life of the agreement. Many taxpayers are familiar with the idea of an offer and compromise from those pennies on the dollar radio and TV spots from a few years ago. This is a real program, but it has been grossly misrepresented to the public in many cases. This program is really for taxpayers who have a tax liability, but do not have sufficient monthly net income and equity and assets to pay the full amount due. When an application for an offer and compromise is submitted, the IRS will thoroughly review all of the information and the documentation provided by the taxpayer, as well as other public records information. The taxpayer will be required to submit a financial analysis to the IRS, along with several months of bank statements, tax returns, monthly expense information, wage and income information, and information related to their equity and assets. If the examiner feels the offer amount represents more than the IRS can hope to collect from the taxpayer, during the remaining collection period, they will agree to accept the offer. In a typical offer situation, 20% of the offer amount is due with the initial application, unless the taxpayer qualifies for low income treatment. In the event the offer is accepted, the taxpayer would need to pay the additional 80% of the offer amount within five months of acceptance. Once full payment of the offer amount has been made, all remaining tax liabilities are zeroed out but the taxpayer must remain compliant with all filing and payment requirements for the next five years. If they do not, the IRS can and will reinstate the original amounts due plus interest. The good news is there are some simple things that every taxpayer can do to protect him or herself going forward. Protect yourself now and avoid stress later. First thing to do is make sure you have an experienced CPA or tax preparer who knows the law. I recommend paying a little extra now for quality representation, which can help save much more down the line in penalties and interest. Another thing that any taxpayer can do is to keep organized records. This will make it much easier for the CPA to accurately prepare the return based on actual figures. And it also helps to have everything organized in the event your return is ever selected for audit. Although it is tempting, especially in light of the low audit percentage, resist the urge to cut corners when preparing your return. Taxpayers who inflate their deductions or underreport income may find that their temporary tax savings is dwarfed by the subsequent assessment years later. And finally, the worst thing a taxpayer can do is to ignore IRS notices. The IRS is not going to forget about an amount that is owed to them and that amount will just continue to grow the longer the taxpayer waits to deal with it. 
and delaying too long may mean that the taxpayer no longer has recourse to dispute an assessment or to request a refund. It also may be a good idea to consult with a tax attorney to represent you with respect to a resolution of your tax liability. At Kroloff, Belcher, Smart, Perry, and Christofferson, we handle many different types of tax matters related to the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board, the Employment Development Department, and the California Department of Taxation and Fee Administration, formerly known as the BOE. We commonly handle personal income liabilities, business employment tax liabilities, audits, appeals, U.S. tax court cases, tax resolution through installment agreements and offers in compromise, lien discharges, penalty abatements, and much more. If you or someone you know is facing a tax situation and is unsure of how to proceed, please do not hesitate to give us a call at 209-478-2000. Thank you.